Hello, my name is Alan Braderick, and I'm joined here today by Kelso Kennedy, the co-founder and CEO of Red Stamp Agency. Thank you for joining us today, Kelso. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Awesome. So uh, to start with, um, let's hear about your history a little bit. How did you begin marketing, and uh, what was it like in the beginning? Yeah, so that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, I've been marketing my, my whole life. And so when I was very, very young, uh, I was lucky enough to have some grandparents, and they lived on Vancouver Island, and they lived on the side of a golf course, right? Not bad. Um, and I obviously learned to golf, uh, but I also learned that golfers are rich, right? Like they got some money that they just love to spend. And so I had an idea that had been done many times before. I'm going to create a lemonade stand. And so got a lemonade stand, got my grandma to go give me a bunch of Kool-Aid from the store and I started selling lemonades. And so that was the beginning of my entrepreneurship. And very, very shortly after I decided marketing helps entrepreneurs do a lot more stuff. Right. And so. I got a little creative and so what I started to do was I went to the holes, you know, two or three holes before my stand. I just put a little sign saying, I bet you're thirsty. I bet you're thirsty and say hi to the kid on hole number eight. And that was it. And just said, hi, say hi to the kid on hole number eight. Um, sure enough, you know, immediately that day, every single person that went by wanted to talk to me. And so marketing, right? Bring in people so that you can sell them. Then I started selling them, right? And so very, very early on, I understood the power of, yeah, it's cool to be an entrepreneur, but you are only good as much as, as good as you can market yourself. And so that was, that was the very, very early days. And then, you know, as I got a little confidence inside what I was doing, you know, I go back to, to my mom uh, on the mainland here and I wanted to keep, keep it going. Right. And so didn't have a golf course, didn't have any lemonade, but I did live in a, in a townhouse complex where there was a lot of people, right? A lot of people, a lot of cars, a lot of busy families and a lot of dirty cars. And so here I go again, right? Not, not reinventing the wheel here, but I got a bucket, got some soap and some water. And I started going door to door and asking people if they wanted their cars to get washed. And it worked really well. But again, I noticed that people wouldn't answer my door or they thought I was a kid and they didn't want to give me money. So I just started to market it. And so I would go around to all the cars uh, that were dirty and on the windows I would write, this car is way too dirty. Talk to the kid that's coming over tomorrow. I came over the next day five times more people were saying yes. And so that was the, the very beginning uh, of me kind of understanding holistically that, you know, everything around us, you know, the old Steve Jobs is made by someone, you know, just as smart, maybe a little smarter, maybe a little dumber than you are, but just came the person who could kind of express themselves and market themselves. So that was, those were the early days. So after your childhood adventures, what kind of stuff did you do in your, you know, in your adolescence or your youth and uh, how did your business life evolve after that? Yeah, good question. So, you know, after I had this superpower, right, like being invincible, understanding that it's literally as much as you're willing to risk is the result you're going to get. Uh, I took that learning, right? I, I took that um, and I pushed myself to, to really get going. And so, yes, lemonade stand, golf, you know, uh, on the golf course. Yes, washing cars around a complex. Fantastic way to learn about business, not necessarily the best way uh, to grow a business. And so, that's when I kind of got involved in computers. So I, I actually never had a computer until I was like 12 years old. I just started to learn, right? And so within two years, I had taught myself uh, to build websites and to also market myself doing that. Uh, and so that was my first business. I started uh, a web design firm, which you know comes back later in my life. Um, but that's what I did. And I had some really good success. And so I started out, uh, I remember I was 14 years old and I had my first client and I wouldn't even phone call them because my voice hadn't changed yet and I didn't want them to know they were, they were working with a, like a kid. And so I just emailed them and they would give them an excuse. Oh, my phone is broken, whatever. It worked out, right? No problem. Uh, and that was, you know, that was great because I could do things, you know, without showing everything that was going on, but also bad because I obviously wasn't that confident in what I was doing. Uh, that went away. And so over the next two years, I grew and I kind of learned like, yeah, this is awesome doing it yourself, but how much more awesome would it be if I could give this work to other people that were now part of my little team? And so I did that and I, and I grew. And I actually grew at such a crazy pace that I was going from a local, you know, small local company to within six months, I was actually like 15 years old and I, made the, I was making the website for Pearl Harbor the movie. And so it's crazy, right? So I'm like working on these like Oscar nominated films. I was working on a project for uh, a Grammy uh, nominated country singer, John Michael Montgomery. And so I was doing these big things again, not ever hopping on the phone, you know, kind of doing things from behind the scenes. Um, and that really taught me a lot. Right. And I kind of, and I kind of grew up that way. Eventually, you know, had a, hit a point in my life when that business was no longer a priority, uh, had some personal things happening and I just kind of 
stopped that business and started to change onto other things. Okay. So then I understand later on you would go on to start a nonprofit, right? So can we hear more about that experience and some, some of the issues, the challenges and the successes you had and then how that influenced your future? Yeah, totally. So, you know, as I kind of transitioned out of that, that past business, I took a, you know, took a little bit to reflect. And uh, I personally was raised by a really, really amazing single mother. And she never, she never had a barrier, right? She always was willing to do what was the next thing. And, and a quick example there is that we, uh, we I was born on the island. We moved over to SFU and we lived together, just her and I. She was going, putting herself through the masters um, and she didn't have any money. So what she did was she actually applied for different grants and that's how we survived. She literally lived off grants while she put herself through uh, a master's at SFU while raising me. And so uh, I never had this like fear of things because of that. And you know, the second thing there is that a part of like to make sure we were fed and make sure that our friends were fed, she actually is the first person to create a food bank at SFU. And so that's still there today. And that was actually built by her. And so, you know, just to give you a little uh, background of like kind of the experiences I've had that led up to this. And so when I was 18, uh, you know, winded down my for-profit business, decided like, let's go, let's, let's do this bigger. Like, let's go back into nonprofit. Did it with my mom. We did it together. We went and we got a grant. Uh, we proved out our system, you know, before we started, like our, our very early premise was like peer to peer help, right? Like we don't need to have everyone getting things given to them. Everybody in the world has an ability. I don't care who you are. Every single person has a thing that they can do. Just got to figure out what it is, right? Just got to find what that thing is. And so we ran an experiment. We were just down here, downtown East side. And my mom actually was a teacher uh, in the downtown East side. So she's very familiar with the community. And so we we're walking around. We found uh, someone she had known and this guy, like amazing guy, he was just talking to him. It's like, Hey, like, you know, tell me about your life. And he's like, I was in this band. I toured for like 12 years. Like, this amazing story. And it's like, well, what's going on? Like, why don't you play guitar anymore? It's like, I don't, I don't have a guitar. Like, I just don't have it anymore. And so I was like, cool, we can solve that. Literally across the road's a pawn shop, walked across the road, got him a guitar for $30. And this guy is like belting out on it, like instantly. And I'm like, that was it? $30? Like all these handouts around here and they couldn't get you a guitar? And so I was like, this is, this is something, right? And so next day we came back, he had the thing tuned up, restringed, ready to go. And I was like, well, why aren't you sharing this knowledge around here? Like, there's so many people that would love to be as good as you. He's like, they don't have a guitar either. I was like, let's do it again. And so I went back to the pawn shop. He gave it to me at half price because he heard what I was doing. Bring it back. All of a sudden, we're across in Oppenheimer Park. This guy's literally got three people learning how to play a guitar. And so we, we validated that very quickly. Um, and that, that, to me, is the way something should work, right? It's not about giving someone something. It's about creating a community that's going to help each other. And so that was what we did. And we ran that for 22 months very, very successfully. Um, <clears throat> and it was really, it's been replicated around the world in different cities, even in Netherlands, you know, in Europe. But ultimately, we came to a point where because this thing was purely government funded, it was going to limit the growth to which I wanted to have. And so that was kind of, you know, what, you know, after those 22 months, I decided to kind of go back into for profit businesses. And that would kind of guide a lot of the things I'd do. Okay. I love that story. It's really inspirational. Thank you. Um, and then how did that experience impact your future ventures? Yeah, that's a good question. And so, you know, when I went back out to the, to the world, right, to figure out like, what's the next thing that I'm going to kind of work on? Uh, it was very clear that one, it has to be big, right? Like I, I, I love small businesses. I appreciate them. The world absolutely needs them, but you're, you're basically signing up for a, a specific limitation, right? Like this business can only grow to X amount of size. And so I want to do something big, right? I want to make sure that we're at the size, like critical mass, right? Size of, uh, you know, that we can actually do something with what we've created. Uh, and so that was it, right? So number one, it had to make, be something that was actually going to grow into something huge. Number two is that it always had to be tied back into being fair, right? And so um, in a business, what does that mean? It's totally objective, right? But we built, we made sure that, you know, everyone that works with us is paid objectively fair. We make sure that, you know, everyone who decides to work with us as a client is always treated completely fair. And so that's always been a core thing. And then, you know, obviously the third one is that everything we do has to be part of the community. And so, you know, what we've done actually right now, um, we're about to launch, you know, pretty little teaser here. Uh, next month, we're rolling out something new that's called Cape. And so we're using, we have this, I, I think we have the best design team in Vancouver. Uh, and I don't just think that we've been told that many times. We won many awards to back that up. Uh, and we want to use that design thinking 
to help out these amazing nonprofits that maybe have that gap, right? They don't know a way to kind of express themselves. If it's through like clothing or through art, uh, we're going to kind of close that gap and help them kind of create more of awareness. Um, so it's, it's tied into, you know, everything we do, but ultimately, uh, my end goal is to build up the business to a big enough point where we can control everything that we're giving back. That's awesome. And like speaking of Cape and of teasers, I'd love to get into your current venture, uh, the business you're working on right now. Um, obviously, you're the founder and the CEO of Red Stamp Agency. It's a marketing agency. Um, so uh, how did you start that? What was the experience of founding the agency and uh, picking the team that you were going to work with? After, you know, doing the nonprofit stuff, I, I went back into, you know, myself running a business on my own. Um, I did that for about six years and there was nothing wrong with it. I was running a managed IT provider. Uh, this was pre you know, Google Cloud and Amazon Web Services, uh, but I saw them coming. And so I decided this is, you know, not the place for me. Uh, and so I, you know, I exited that business and I started uh, to work towards a red stamp. And so the first thing I did is I made a checklist. Like, what do I actually want to do out of this business? And so number one on that list uh, is that I wanted to have a co-founder. And so, and I've always been a solo entrepreneur. It's really lonely, right? Like you are the only one in the business that you can trust. Uh, and you have a lot of people that you do trust, but at the end of the day, you're the only person in there that kind of has a voice. And that's fantastic for some people, not for me, right? I, I like to do things with other people. So I wanted to find a co-founder. I wanted to make a business that could start off with something and then evolve into whatever I wanted. And so that's something key here of why I decided to work on an agency is that yes, right now we're solving amazing problems for some of the most amazing innovative companies in the world. But ultimately we've created this laser of talent, right? And I can point that laser wherever I decide to do that in the future. And the key thing is just creating this team that fundamentally is amazing, right? And like you see a lot of these companies that have grown overnight in one or two years and they're doing amazing work, but they don't have a team where everyone knows each other deeply. They don't have a team that's been working together for many, many years. And like, they're not designed to be that way. A lot of ventures are only around for five or six years and then they exit and then everyone goes off and do their next thing. And so, that was important to me. It's like something that we can kind of evolve over time. And you know, even like talking to my co-founder at the time, we were looking at like, you know, Hudson's Bay company, right? Everyone's got the Hudson's Bay blanket, 135 years old. I want hundred years from now everyone to be wearing the red stamp blanket, right? And so I want to create a part of BC and that's the only way to do it. And so that was the beginning. We, we went off, um, my co-founder that I picked, uh, his name is Spencer. And we actually had been friends. We had been online buddies our whole lives, right? And so, uh, this is back in the day, there's this thing called IRC where like all the hackers would talk, but really it's just a chat room. And you know, we were both designers and we, he was actually going back to those Pearl Harbor website days. He was the guy who was getting to help me. And so we've been working together since we we're like 14, 15 years old. Uh, now, you know, this is many years later. Um, and so we decided like, let's, let's start this thing. And so he's working in Utah. I'm working in Vancouver. We had never physically met in person. And we're just going at it. And so that's what we did. We just, we went at it. And so the first year of the business was let's get some work, right? And so we went out and we're like, who needs a website? Like literally anyone. We found a roofing company. We found a plastic surgeon. Uh, we found a restaurant and like they bought a website and they got a website worth a hundred times more than they paid for. And the reason was that they took a risk on us, but the only reason we wanted to work with them was to create a portfolio and just show that we were able to do what we were able to do. And so it worked out really well uh, and we did that. And then once we kind of built up a portfolio, we, we launched our site. We built a site and we launched it. And so now as the marketing comes into play, right? So how do we go from Canuck Roofing, which was a client of ours, which was a great friend of mine, an amazing company, to like these enterprise level, you know, Hootsuites and the Airtables of the world, like how did that happen? And so what we did was we got intentional, right? So one, we realized, you know, let's, let's define who we want to work with. And so this was innovative tech companies, SaaS companies. And two, let's figure out a way to talk to them. And so what I did was um, there's a site called Quora. It's a question and answer site. You can go there and, you know, it's like a community. And I kind of noticed something. If you go on Google and you type in who's the best agency for tech companies, this Quora answer was the number one result. And so I'm like, all right, cool. So I went on to Quora. I put a nice little answer about why Red Stamp is the best tech agency. Went out to all my buddies on IRC and we all voted it up. And so overnight, number one, we're number one in Google for the best tech agency, right? And so it worked over the next three week period. We got 142 leads. Crazy, right? By the way, we've never had 142 leads ever since. Like that was our best week of our company history. And we've been around for 10 years. And so that was great, but also not so great because we weren't ready for it, right? And so we had to like give these people a proposal and we had to talk to them. We got to respond to about maybe 35 of them before, you know, we just ran out of energy. Uh, we would have, hopefully we could have done more. Uh, and, you know, some follow-up calls, et cetera. 
one person agreed to work with us. And so that was our ticket, right? And so this company was called Crowdflower. Uh, it was a Silicon Valley you know, success story. Uh, their founder was this guy named Lucas Bewald. He was like a Forbes top 25 under 25, you know, Stanford valedictorian, you name it, right? This guy is just like genius. And so you know, we, the, the marketing guy that kind of found us, Tim Matthews, uh, he pulled us down there. He's like, okay hey guys, you gotta come down here and present what you're doing to, these, to, our, to our team. And we're like, all right, let's do it. And so I hop in a plane, he hops in a plane. We meet together very first time in the San Francisco airport. We hop on an Uber, which by the way, is like 2012, it was like super cool, we didn't have in Vancouver yet. You know, we hopped on an Uber, we rolled into this, you know, Silicon Valley startup, Crowdflower, and we're there, right? And so um, we, we, we make our, our meeting, right? And so we go up, we like, we see the office, we get to meet everyone, uh, and then we go into this meeting with the executive, uh, with the CMO and the CEO, and we show them, like, we just worked on this for like a week, like, here's your new messaging, like, this is your company's message, you know, this is what you do and why you're amazing. And so the CEO looks at it and he reads it. This is effing garbage, shuts his laptop and walks out the door. <laughs> yeah, so that wasn't exactly exciting. Um, but the good news was that CMO comes back into the room and he's like, okay guys, wasn't a hit, but this is how he is, right? Like he's, he just, it's either good or bad, like, and there is no middle. And so it's okay. And so we're like, all right, what do, how do we fix this? How do we fix this? So he's like, he gives us the feedback. We go back to the hotel, which for some reason, they only had one room available and is one bed. So yeah, you do the math there, whatever, we're buddies, right? And so, you know, we get into the room, we don't even sleep. We just spent all night working on this next version. Finally, the next day comes, we come into the office, we do the same thing, we show him the work. He reads it, he's like, okay, you guys are in. Walks out the room again. We're like, oh, thank goodness, right? So we, we did the thing. And, you know, basically that, I consider that like two, like that 48 hours, is when we pivoted from like, how do you work for local small businesses to like, how do you provide value to a company that just sold a month, uh, about 12 months ago for $350 million. And so that, that was the, the moment, right? And so what happened is we both took a plane back to Vancouver. He came back with me. He stayed with me in my apartment. My girlfriend went back to her parents for a few months. And uh, we literally just went at it. We were working. We made the new website for Crowdflower. Uh, he eventually got his immigration stuff together and just moved up here and away we went. And so that was the, the beginning days uh, of RedStamp. And, you know, since then we've just kind of, we've actually been able to double our business every single year outside of the last year um, and to grow up to where we are today. That's amazing. So there was also a previous interview that you did where you noted that um, one of your proudest achievements is that RedStamp was awarded one of the top 10 workplaces in British Columbia. Uh, and so I was wondering, since then, since that achievement, what has been the next proudest achievement? What was the next thing that you're most proud of that has happened to this company? So that one was really big because we didn't even expect it and uh, we didn't even nominate ourselves. It came from someone in our company who decided to do that. And so it meant more because, let's be honest, most awards are like completely biased or, you know, some darn thing, right? And so it meant, it meant more because we didn't have to buy it and it was actually like a legitimate thing. And since then, you know, we've won some amazing things. I still consider that one the best because it means that we were actually to be able to build something instead of do something. Uh, but since then, we've been able to win um, the, the Spike Award for Best Business in Port Moody in 2019. Um, and then I personally got awarded the Tri-City Young Professional of the Year uh, from the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce. So those two are pretty big for, for me and the business. Um, but I don't know if I consider them bigger than that one. Okay. Still pretty big though. Still pretty big. Um, also personal to me because uh, I'm from Port Moody and so obviously I hear about all these spike awards every year that they go out and you know which one of my friends businesses was able to win them. So it's cool to meet people when they're uh, yes. local and involved in the community and it's great to see spike winners out there. So obviously COVID's big. Um, you and I had this really weird moment when we walked in here and we're like we're in a physical office space right now for the first time in forever. Um, so how has Red Stamp pivoted since the beginning of the pandemic? Yeah it's been tough. It's been tough uh, for multiple reasons. You know, the first one that everyone's always wondering about, it's like, oh, now we're working remotely. We, we work remotely forever, right? Like our first two years of our business, I was, you know, in a different location than my co-founder. And so that wasn't that hard for us because we'd always had that built into our business. We've always had full-time remote employees. We've always been uh, aimed at having the most flexible place to work uh, in terms of where you do your work and not, uh, and also when you're able to do your work. And so that part, in, in kind of in essence wasn't hard for us to understand but because of the size we got to a lot of people on our team had never worked remotely and so they they're, they're relying on the office and they've based their their schedules around this right especially folks who had kids 
or had other things where they kind of had a really structured day and that was tough for them, right? Like, especially when the kids had to stay home from school, it's like, hey, like, that's way more important than whatever it is you were doing at work. And we had to, like, completely agree with that, right? And I don't think there's any other way to think about it. And so, you know, that was tough. Um, ultimately, you know, the funny thing is, like, I've personally always been in germaphobe my whole life. And so, uh, example, you know, when we do cakes at Red Stamp, we've, for the last couple of years, we haven't even blown on the candles. We, we do this thing where we, like, wave the... The candles out and now we've learned that you can get like a clear box to put on top of it so you can blow so we're like we're always thinking about this stuff already um and so you know ultimately the things that have changed were you know we had to become a little bit more sustainable um we you know we actually had some layoffs in the last year that we weren't uh, anticipating and it sucks because you know like i mentioned we doubled our business every single year until COVID hit and um, you know, the, the adjustment of like just being, you know, being able to keep the business afloat without having to lay people off, you know, we've made some adjustments around that to make sure we're structured for the future. But overall, we've definitely not been hit as, as nearly as hard as a lot of folks. So as a student myself, I'd love to hear more about the advice that you have for people who are looking to break into the marketing industry. The advice that I would give to anyone who's actually trying to kind of break into the marketing world, especially in the agency world, is to one, have patience, right? Like the, the way that people are marketing these days is, is not the way that it used to. And it's not gonna be the way that people are marketing a year or two from now. And that's just always gonna change. You're always gonna be leveling up your skills. You're always gonna be seeing what new is out there and just be, just be ready for that. And if you're not doing that, you're probably not going down the right path. Like if you're doing the same thing you were learning in school on day one, five years from now, it's probably not effective, right? Probably everybody's probably marketing that same way now. And it's probably just a way, you know, that people were growing. And then two is like, make sure if, if you've chosen to go down the marketing path, like you got to know how to market, right? And don't be afraid to do that. Like go out there and build your own website. Like go out there and give yourself like a name, create a podcast, create a video, go around interviewing all the people that you know. I guarantee you that those people are going to get the most doors open for them. An example, um, we were, we got invited down to, to kind of give a talk to like a meetup group once and like all those, all those founders inside of there, they were kind of thinking the same way, right? Like we created this meetup group and yeah, it's great to kind of, you know, meet all these people and do, you know, great things for the community. But ultimately I'm just creating a network for myself, right? Every time someone comes here to get interviewed, every time someone comes through here to give us advice, that's now someone who's now opened themselves up to me for my future. And so Think about those, those two-way wins, right? They can kind of win and yourself now, but also set you up in the future. So we talk a lot about the future. Um, and obviously you've talked about how marketing now isn't what it used to be. So I'd love to touch on how you think marketing is gonna go in the future. Any really exciting trends that you're paying attention to right now and where you think the industry is headed? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. So I would say that the number one thing that's gonna change is personalization. And so like, think, 20 years from now, right? 15, 20 years from now, like you go right now, you want to buy a thing. You're going to go buy like some nice Lululemon pants, right? So you get to the website. Cool. You see a nice Lululemon model. Maybe they look like you, maybe they don't. And then you go through and like, you got to pick your size and then you go through and then you got to fill out all your information. But like, how do we make that more personalized? Right? So one, when I arrive to the page, it should be people who look just like me, right? They should be wearing the exact same size that I'm looking for and it should reflect exactly what I'm looking for. And if I send that link to you, you'll see someone who looks just like you and it will be personalized to your approach. The writing should be exactly the way you like to talk. It should be coming, it should be trained by your social media. It should be trained by the way you write emails. It should be set up exactly the way you want to consume that information. You shouldn't have to pick a size. The priority of color should already be suggested to you based on your own styles. And so that's an idea of like how things are happening, right? And so how that happens right now is just as simple as, you know, personalizing, say, a blog post, right? You go there, you want to see a call to action saying, you know, students come here. And I go there and I want to see an action like CEOs go here. And that alone is going to be a, a simple step. And so personalization is, is huge. But then, like, how do we use that personalization, right? And so, you know, right now, most people, yeah, we're all, we've kind of evolved to our phones. Some people got advanced and they use like Alexa and Siri, but like not really. That's, you know, that's still kind of a subsection, but it's not going to go away, right? Like there's kids right now who uh, heard a story actually from a Microsoft executive where her two-year-old kid like orders things off Alexa, right? Like from Amazon. And so my like 50-year-old friends don't know how to do that, right? And so it's like just going to become part of the generation. And so like as people are growing up with these tools, they'll just 
organically know how to do it in intuitively. And so think about that, right? Think about how voice is going to be happening and why is that important, right? Like that's, that's important because the search engines are no longer going to work the same way, right? You're going to ask Alexa a question instead of searching and going to the ninth result. And so it's very, very different way of marketing. And so that's one aspect. The second aspect is like how we consume that information. So it's going to be very quickly where like augmented reality, virtual reality are actually becoming mainstream, right? And some people are on the fence about it. Like virtual reality, yeah, like it might, might take us a little while to kind of get there, but augmented reality, we're already doing it. It's just on your phone. Like why not put it in your glasses? We already have it working. It just needs to go on my glasses, right? And so that is going to change everything. And again, we don't have the selection available, right? So it's, it's what's available to me first, what's coming up on my screen here, what's the first answer. And even as you search Google, you're now getting your answers inside of Google instead of taking you to that next page. And so I, the, the two things I would say is personalization and then where you're going to actually consume that information. Those, those trends are just so, so big right now and they're just never going to go away. Thank you so much for your insights about the future of the industry. And I can't wait personally to see where you and Red Stamp go in the future as well. Thank you so much to Market One for the studio time. And thank you so much to the Marketing Accelerator program for these opportunities. And thank you for watching.